Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, from wherever you may be joining us in the world today. My name is Francesco Del Carpio, and I am the CFAL York Operations Coordinator. I would like to officially open the first part of our Canadian response to the earthquake in Turkey and Syria Symposium in partnership with YEMERGE and IAEM Canada with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge and recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territory upon which our campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. The area is known as Tekaranto and has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and that the territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. As this is an online event, our participants may be joining from various locations, so I strongly encourage you to learn about the traditional land upon which you are located. With this, I welcome our moderators, our speakers, and our participants from around the world. Welcome to our symposium. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderators, Sonia Singh and Media Hadi. Sonia is an emergency management and public health professional with over 27 years of experience working in the public sector at the municipal, regional, provincial, and federal levels. She has a master's in public safety from Wilfrid Laurier University and bachelor degrees in toxicology and environment health from the University of Toronto and Ryerson University, respectively. Currently, Sonia works for Markham Fire and Emergency Services, managing the emergency management and business continuity programs for the city of Markham. She has held this position for over the past 12 years, and in her spare time, she is an online instructor for the Disaster and Emergency Management Program at the Northern Alberta Institute for Technology. Media Hadi worked in the humanitarian sector at the UN Refugee Agency in Amman, Jordan, working with vulnerable communities in the Middle East. She later moved on to manage health, education, emergency, wash, and food security programs in the Middle East and Africa, heavily focused on developing and implementing conflict-sensitive sustainable emergency programs locally in countries of operation. Media currently works at the Office of Emergency Management at the City of Mississauga as an emergency management specialist. I will now pass over the floor to Professor Ali Asgari and Professor Jiang Hong Wu to introduce CFAL York and why emerge. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Francesco, and uh, dear participants, dear speakers and moderators. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, it is indeed our pleasure uh, to, to organize this uh, very important event uh, to learn from each other, uh, share experience, uh, and also uh, set the stage for future generations to learn from, uh, from this event and also uh, be able to build capacity for uh, responding to future uh, events. Uh, also, I would like to begin with uh, remembering uh, all those lives, uh, nearly 60,000 uh, people who were lost during uh, this major uh, disaster event, and offer our sincere condolences to, to the uh, families um, uh, in Turkey and Syria. And we also want to reflect that uh, still many of uh, those who were injured are in hospital or in the recovery process. We, we share um, uh, and uh, understand their, their situations and, and we wish them uh, health and um, uh, recovery soon. We also understand that many people, millions indeed, are, uh, are suffering still uh, and living in temporary shelter at this point as we speak. And, uh, we we also hope uh, the the situation get better as as recovery construction starts and and going. Our goal is, as I said, to bring in uh, speakers, uh, agencies involved uh, in in humanitarian response uh, from uh, Canada in particular uh, to share their experiences. We learn from them. They learn from each other and uh, and so on. Uh, so uh, this is uh, from CFAL York, and I uh, also would like to uh, have uh, our uh, Professor Jian Hong Wu from YEMERGE to provide uh, uh, his introductory remarks and uh, soon going to, to your presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. I'm Jian Hong Wu, um, distinguished uh, moderator, the uh, speaker, and, uh, and the panelists and all uh, participants. Um, I'm the uh, uh, inaugural uh, director of the York. Uh, emergency mitigation engagement response and governance institute or why emerge this is a university center of excellence 
in the subject areas of uh, relevant disaster emergency. It's a center building on the collective uh, uh, expertise from uh, six faculties, the Pine University Research Centers, uh, uh, to catalyze and uh, integrate our uh, knowledge and expertise uh, to lead to a uh, advanced research and training in the subject areas. We are very pleased to uh, collaborate with CIFA, uh, the UN Training Research Center and the leadership of Ali Ashgari to organize uh, events like this to deal with issues uh, that we consider of global importance and issues that really need to bring different stakeholders together to see how uh, we can do better uh, um, uh, next time. So today is a very great uh, event uh, with the effort of my uh, colleague, especially Ali Shkari, to bring our uh, major stakeholders, the NGO part, to uh, issues uh, natural disasters, uh, which is one of the major research themes within our research institutes. So I'm happy uh, uh, that we are part of it. And I just want to thank all the, again, the speakers and the participants for your uh, participation and for your contribution. Back to you, Ali. Back to you, Sonia. Hi, everyone, and thank you for being here. Um, just doing some housekeeping. Uh, we have uh, a chat that is available, a uh, question and answer section. So uh, as presenters are presenting, if you have any questions, please, by all means, open up the question and answer section. And uh, if you can, direct, if you have specific questions directed to um, one of the speakers, please uh, just jot that down just before your question. If it's to all of them, then that's fine. Um, we will introduce each speaker. Uh, there are four in the first section. And uh, after that, we will have a question, an open question and answer um, period. And then we'll go into the second half of uh, this session. Um, is there anything else I'm missing, Media? Media and I are both uh, co-moderating, and I'm excited to uh, moderate with her because of her background and experience. So, Media, do I, did I miss anything? No, no, sorry. I think you got all of it. Yeah. Okay, great. So, without further ado, we're going to start this session. Um, the first speaker, um, first two speakers for the presentation, is Rebecca Chun Aloy. She is a programs and operations officer at the International Development and Relief Foundation. She manages a diverse portfolio of emergency response, WASH, health, education, and food projects. She has overseen successful initiatives in countries such as Palestine, Turkey, India, Afghanistan, Guyana, and Somalia. She holds a Master's of Management of an End of Applied Science in Global Health Systems from Western University, a Bachelor of Arts in Global Politics from Carleton. And she has worked in Tanzania and Uganda where she collaborated with local partners to deliver high impact programs for youth, women, bolstering their economic development and health rights. Along with Rebecca, we have Hanan Maulin. She's a programs and operations officer also with International Development and Relief Foundation. She currently manages uh, diverse global programs in the areas of WASH, food and nutrition, health, education, and emergency assistance in several countries such as Bangladesh, Jordan, Pakistan, Somalia, South Africa, and Yemen. Hanan holds a Master's of Science in Global Health from McMaster University and an Honours Bachelor degree from University of Toronto. During her postgraduate studies, her research focused on global health program delivery in humanitarian emergencies. She has worked with various global health organizations and centers and, global, uh, and a global uh, think tank. So thank you both for being here and we look forward to your presentation. Um, you have the stage. Thank you so much, Sonia, and thank you to everyone. 
Um, my name is Rebecca Chenaloy, and I'm here with my colleague, Hanam Mualam. As Sonia said, we are Programs and Operations Officers with the International Development and Relief Foundation. IDRF is a Canadian charity that works to address the needs of vulnerable populations globally. And since 1984, IDRF has provided humanitarian aid and sustainable development programs without discrimination across South Asia, the Middle East, Africa, and the Americas. IDRF supports local solutions to development and invests directly in locally based organizations for all of our projects. By emphasizing a localization approach, this helps to ensure that programs meet the community's most pressing needs in relevant and appropriate ways, and the benefits can be sustained over the long term. At IDRF, we have programs in the areas of health, water sanitation and hygiene, food security and nutrition, economic development and emergency response. One of our recent emergency responses is through our projects in response to the Turkey-Syria earthquakes. In particular, our emergency efforts focus on short-term interventions and long-term programming. We do this by prioritizing sustainability through the respond, rebuild, recover, resilience implementation process during an emergency response. IDRF has been implementing humanitarian relief and sustainable development programs in Turkey through local partners for 24 years and Syria for 12 years. The International Blue Crescent Foundation, IBC, is a key IDRF implementing partner. And prior to the earthquakes, IDRF was collaborating with IBC to support Uyghur refugees in Turkey and support programs through a community center. Particularly, IDRF has been supporting a community so center located in Kilis. As you can see on the map on the slide, Kilis is near the epicenter of the earth earthquake. The Kilis Community Center provides psychosocial support activities, courses, cultural and social cohesion activities, and other services to Syrian and Afghan refugees, as well as Turkish host communities. And the, the Kilis Community Center in particular has been central to our emergency response. With an established local partner already present, IDRF was able to respond immediately to the earthquakes as priorities were identified soon after. So since IDRF works on a two-pronged approach, we are currently in phase one, which is the emergency response. And within the first 24 hours of the earthquakes, the community center was able to pivot from providing its usual sustainable development activities, which Hanan had previously mentioned, to our response by providing temporary shelter for about 500 people. And there we served about 1,000 meals per day. We were also able to provide emergency kits that included blankets, clothing, and baby items initially. This transition was able to happen quickly because the community center was already pre-established and its use as a temporary shelter and available availability to provide hot meals and safely, safety quickly traveled by word of mouth. We heard from our partners in the field that there were families that traveled as far as Kamaramarash, which is over 100 kilometers from Kilis to gain access to these resources that were offered out of the center. And in the first few weeks after the earthquakes, the center was open 24 hours a day, and the majority of our IBC staff uh, based in Kilis stayed at the center to ensure the operations and the safety of the individuals staying there. So since the initial response, the center continues to provide temporary shelter for about four families and some staff members that are waiting for other accommodations such as container homes, which we will talk about later. And since the community, since then, the community center has returned to its regular activities with the addition of providing food and hygiene kits for the community. Overall, our commitment and response to the earthquake uh, involves different activities. In particular, IDRF has supported the provision of 500 hot meals daily for the 50, first 50 days following the earthquake, and an additional 120 meals are being provided with recent funding. The distribution, there has also been a distribution of 7,500 food packages, which would be suitable for a month for a family. 
Our response also included an additional 4,000 nutrition kits for children, which included energy bars, nuts, juice, and dried fruit. And in addition, in addition to these food packages in both Syria and Turkey, we are providing 1,500 family hygiene kits, as well as 2,500 female-specific kits, which include menstrual pads and other items women express a need for, as well as 1,500 infants infant specific kits, which included diapers, wipes, and baby food as part of these distributions. A key uh, part of our um, response is the provision of container shelters. So IDRF is funding the installation of 75 container shelters in Turkey. These containers are well insulated and more secured compared to tents, which um, a lot of families and individuals are living in. However, we do acknowledge the need for an increased number of container homes in all of the affected regions. As you can see on the slide, the interior, there's, uh, the, you can see the interior and exterior of the container shelter. And additionally, with the thousands of people who suffered from injuries, um, and long, there is a need for long and short term physiotherapy services. So we are providing this with six physiotherapists in the region and the provision of 50 wheelchairs for individuals who suffered from amputation of lower limbs and paralysis as a result of crush injuries. And also to a couple of these services, we have set up a special needs fund, which is cash assistance for medical and physiotherapy needs in both countries. We also take into consideration the psychological effects of an event such as this. So for children specifically, we have a mobile caravan that visits different areas each day to provide entertainment and social activities for children. And we heard that many parents use this time and take advantage of it, of the time when their children have supervised structured time and activities um, in order to take care of their own personal needs and commitments. Rebecca and I visited Turkey in March and conducted a monitoring and evaluation assessment with our partners at IBC. We heard from our team on the ground, assessed our current project activities and identified areas where we can invest in long-term recovery. So with that, we would like to share some insights from this assessment and what we heard from our partners. Absolutely. Uh, so some of the key takeaways that we had following our m and &E visit is that Having a coordinated effort is really key, just like with all of our colleagues here. So one of our colleagues on the ground highlight, highlighted this as he explained that he himself experienced the earthquakes of 1999, which also happens to be the first response that IDRF did in Turkey. Um, and this led him to pursue a career in emergency response. And he emphasized that you don't need a large task force to get everything done, but you do need the right systems in place and to work together to achieve a singular outcome. And we really saw this in practice with our partners at IBC. We also want to acknowledge that since we use a localized approach, our partners and our teams in the field live, work, and play in the areas that are directly affected. We heard stories from our colleagues of evacuating their seven month old twins from their home. Our colleagues' parents refusing to enter a temporary shelter, but staying in their car. And these are reminders at, that are important to us as an organization and as folks that manage these projects from afar, that our partners are experiencing the same devastation that they are responding to. And hearing these stories are what guided us throughout our visit and what guide us in our work um, following. As we drove around different areas during our visit, we saw destroyed and damaged buildings and, individual, uh, and individuals and families living in tents outside their homes. We also, we also saw people going into damaged buildings and homes to retrieve their belongings. And with that, there is an added risk of injury and death. As we walked in certain areas, we were advised to wear masks due to asbestos in the destroyed building materials. And this also poses long-term health implications. One poignant part of our visit is when we visited a tented camp where Syrian refugees were housed in Nurdugi. 
the living conditions were quite poor. The ground was muddy. It was also lightly raining during our visit. So there was a, another risk of the interior of the tents getting wet. The top right, uh, sorry, the top left photo shows us, um, shows uh, uh, the the camp, uh, the kid, the children at the camp and one of the IBC staff with them from the mobile caravan. Um, uh, so it was very unfortunate to see the living conditions um, at that camp um, and really showed, uh, stressed the importance of having uh, more sh shelter, uh, container shelters for the time being. Um, and the mobile caravan in general as well helps provide uh, important um, is a great way for different for children to participate in different activities and helps them cope with the conditions they are experiencing. And the top left photo is us with the children and the mobile caravan at, at the back in, in the background. We also visited a container shelter camp in Elvistan where Turkish citizens were mainly housed. The camp was uh, fairly uh, clean and secure. Families had also, act also had access to their own washroom, which eliminated the potential safety risks with traveling far to use the washroom. The earthquakes generally have created social tensions and damaged um, the social cohesion that has been taking place over the years. It was unfortunate to see the separation of Syrian refugees and Turkish host communities in the camp settings in light of these tensions and the, dispar the disparities in the living of the living conditions of different groups was also disheartening. Overall, we say that there's a greater need for container homes and long-term sustainable development specific to vulnerable subgroups of the affected population, such as Syrian refugees. And as we plan to move to phase two, we plan to incorporate the lessons learned from our assessment and continue to collaborate with our local partner to understand what these needs and priorities will look like. And uh, thank you for listening. Um, and it was a pleasure to share the platform, uh, to have been invited to this event and share the platform with, with other great organizations that are doing work on the ground. You can um, visit our website and follow us on our different platforms to know more. You can also con contact myself, Hanan Malim, and my email is there, as well as my uh, colleague, Rebecca Chan Aloy, whose email is also on the screen. Thank you both for your presentation. Um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot to think about there. And then, I mean, uh, I was just texting media and it's, it's a lot. It's a lot to see. It's a lot to experience. Um, and honestly, the work that you do is just incredible. And thank you for your, your uh, presentation. Please reminding everyone, uh, if you have questions, put them in the chat and uh, the question and answer section. And uh, we'll move forward to our next presenter, which is Melanie Wubbs. And she's a technical specialist with the International Unit of Samaritan's Purse, working with them since 2017. She deploys often as lead for assessment and setup of complex emergency medical responses, most recently uh, in the field for the initial assessment and hospital director of the type three emergency field hospital in Antakya, Turkey. Melanie, thank you again for being here. We look forward to your presentation. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, like Sonia said, uh, my name is Melanie and I'm a technical health specialist with, um, with the International Health Unit of um, Samaritan's Purse. So today I'm gonna share with you all just a little bit about our emergency response in Turkey, uh, focusing a little bit in on the kind of first interventions, um, then the ongoing other sectors that we worked in um, and our plans for the future. So for those of you who might not be familiar with Samaritan's Purse. Uh, Samaritan's Purse is an international humanitarian organization. Uh, we have head offices here in Canada, in Calgary, um, as well as the US, the United Kingdom, Germany, and Australia. Uh, we work globally um, in kind of two capacities. Uh, first, in our long-term established field offices. These are around the globe, primarily in areas with uh, protracted um, humanitarian um, emergencies such as the DRC, 
South, South Sudan and Ethiopia. Um, we also work extensively with partners around the globe, um, just grassroots organizations, um, working with them both as a grantor as well as with um, program management uh, support. Um, and then our third is our disaster assistance response teams. So these are teams that act very quickly um, during uh, natural disasters, conflict, or infectious disease outbreaks. And this was the arm um, that responded in Turkey. So when the earthquake happened on February 6th, um, our uh, disaster assistance response team immediately stood up um, and started to send um, that advanced assessment team to the region. So I myself uh, was in Ethiopia, so was redirected to Turkey, uh, where we did have existing local partners who we were able to kind of be in touch with right away um, to get things moving as far as a response. Now, our primary initial response was uh, with health. So as many of you may be aware, uh, the Turkish government has a robust emergency response organization called AFAD, um, and they handled primarily the initial response, but with an earthquake, especially an earthquake that happened in such a densely populated area, um, the amount of injuries um, just can quickly overwhelm a healthcare system, especially in Turkey, where so many of the hospitals were also damaged. Um, so the Ministry of Health, um, in coordination with the WHO, uh, enacted the emergency medical teams me mechanism. So emergency medical teams are um, teams that are from around the world. Many of them are um, run by governments um, and in conjunction with their military, um, but also through NGOs. Um, that respond in kind of a prescribed manner, whether that's through mobile med medical teams, um, emergency field hospitals, or specialized um, medical teams uh, like maternity or infectious disease outbreaks. So they're kind of a prescribed um, response. And so the invitation was sent out for teams to respond and Samaritan's Purse put forward um, our offer of a type three field hospital. Um, and this was accepted by the Ministry of Health and the government of Turkey on Wednesday the 8th. So um, that was um, uh, processed um, and I was on site in Turkey in Adana that Wednesday and on Thursday we were assigned our location. So we were located down in Thai state uh, in the city of Antakya. Antakya is a city of over 400,000 people. Um, and their main hospital there, the Hatai State Hospital, had suffered incredible damage. Um, so while um, uh, my colleagues back in the U.S. picked up the emergency field hospital that's um, staged and ready to deploy at a moment's notice, um, we were able to work very closely with the Turkish Ministry of Health and their emergency EMT team, UMCA, um, to start all of the preliminary arrangements. So selecting the site, um, working in close coordination as far as what our capacities were going to be um, and uh, prepping for the arrival of the team. So the Ministry of Health and UMCA had set up um, a receiving station at, in the parking lot of this hospital to receive patients and transport them quickly outside of the region. So they, they, they were there, they were working really hard. Um, it was just as you can imagine, um, incredibly overwhelming, just the volume of the patients um, and just how far they had to be transferred uh, to be at facilities that were still functional. So um, the um, hospital arrived on Friday night and over a Saturday morning. Um, and so we moved very quickly to set up the hospital during the day on Saturday and overnight in, into Sunday. So while the physical structure was being set up, just working in close coordination uh, with the Ministry of Health, because as you can imagine, it's one thing to set up a hospital, it's, it's another thing to make sure you're embedded well with a system um, and that you're aiding it and not creating um, a duplicate system or anything like that. So um, the hospital was set up over the next two days. Um, as you can see here, here's just an aerial shot of the hospital once it was completely set up. 
And uh, this just kind of shows you a little bit more about the hospital. So as an EMT team, um, when we deploy and we deploy to disasters, you're required to be completely fully self-sufficient. So whether that's generators, water, all of the systems, you're there to take a burden off of the existing healthcare system, not add in, because it's one thing to set up a tent and then be like, oh, but can we borrow this or do you have that? Uh, we need to come up, we need to come in and be fully self-sufficient um, and able to operate Im immediately. So this just kind of gives a little bit of an outline of all of the components of the hospital uh, triage. So like I said, we were co-located with the Turkish EMT team. Um, so we triage together, seeing which patients would be best suited at this facility or their facility, which had obstetrics um, and um, that sort of thing. Um, and then the emergency department, um, lab, pharmacy, x-ray, ultrasound, um, two operating rooms, um, and then all of the support, um, the staff housing, the admin, all of the medical supplies, everything needs to be fully self-sufficient and on site. Um, so you're not placing any more burden on a very fragile system. Um, so we opened on, um, oh, we opened on um, Monday, February 13th. So one week after the earthquake. So a lot of the major injuries from an earthquake happen and need to be cared for right in that initial first day, that second day. Um, but even one week out, there is still an incredible amount of earthquake related trauma um, that we were seeing uh, fractures, wounds, um, maybe bones that had just been simply casted, but really needed surgery. Um, people who were being injured in the um, the rescue efforts as they moved debris and things like that. We were also um, incredibly privileged to be able to prepare for some people who even one week after the earthquake were being removed from the rubble. Um, so being able to provide this level of healthcare right close to the epicenter of a disaster is so critical um, for not just the patient's medical care, um, but also just for their overall um, care. If they're being transferred out, which they were to great other hospitals, um, so suddenly there's a huge burden on their family. How are they gonna get there? How are they gonna care? How are they gonna support their family um, when they're so far away? So being able to provide that kind of very geographically relevant care um, is just such a critical piece of this. Uh, we were able, like I mentioned, to be fully integrated into the Turkish emergency response system. So we received ambulances. We were also able to refer to other facilities um, for things outside of the scope of a field hospital. Um, so somebody who needed um, uh, like a heart cath or things like that. Uh, we were also open to the community. So we were seeing patients who were coming in, yes, with earthquake related injuries, but maybe it was a like a fractured arm and they just self-presented or a child um, with a in injury or a sickness. And the reality is, is even though there is an earthquake, um, all of the rest of people's medical concerns still continue. And if anything, they are um, exacerbated because they don't have access to their medications. Perhaps they were in their house that was crushed or they haven't had access to their regular doctors and treatments that they would normally have on a, reg on a regular basis. Um, in addition, we also with the type three field hospital have two operating theaters. Um, so we had two orthopedic surgeons as well as a general surgeon. So they were kept very busy, as you could imagine, um, with uh, broken bones, crush injuries, wounds, um, and even things just as routine as an appendicitis um, when there's no access to a hospital. All of those normal um, kind of things still do continue on. So we're able to provide that care uh, right there in um, Amtakia. The other thing um, that kind of was a major event in those first two weeks was the third earthquake on February 20th. Um, I'm not too sure exactly how much in international media attention was given to this, but on February 20th, um, just outside of Antakya, there was a third earthquake, a 6.3 on the, the Richter scale. Um, so this happened at about eight o'clock at night. Um, we were in the hospital 
it was there was aftershocks and the earth moved constantly <laughs> um, but this was a quite a significant event all of um, the things fell off the shelves um, tables and things fell over um, and it was quite shocking not just for our patients and our staff in in the hospital who obviously had the trauma of being in the first earthquake um, but where we were where our hospital was situated was also the staging grounds for all of the um, the the ambulances in the region um, and within three minutes after the earth earth stopped quaking the lights the sirens all of them headed out to the city. As you can see, um, even if buildings hadn't fallen during the first earthquake, they were at high risk to fall during this next one. Um, and they did. Um, us, the Ministry of Health, all of the other EMTs, we went into a mass casualty mode. Um, and that night we received um, over hundred patients within a four hour span. Um, more injuries, more crushes, um, people who were buried in the rubble. Um, and also, unfortunately, one or two hospitals that had been partially functional because they had some damage, but not complete damage, they were damaged beyond repair that night. So suddenly, an uh, ICU that had 10 patients, an ER that had 50 patients, they're transferring their patients over and things like that. So it was a really challenging, um, it was a really challenging night, but it was also a privilege um, to be there when a disaster happened. Um, that's not something that we often, we're often coming in after the a fact. So that was, that was a privilege to be there. Um, and we continued to see patients. Um, we were open, um, I'll go into this in a little bit, um, but as kind of time went on from the earthquake, yes, the original injuries suffered during the earthquake decreased, but people needed long-term rehab. They needed physio, they needed, a second revision, they needed ongoing skin grafting for those wounds. Um, but also we saw a large increase in health issues caused by displacement. Um, so people who were living in cars, people who were living in tents, still in the cool weather, developing pneumonia, um, burns, um, suffered from fires and unsafe heating sources. So um, not only does the earthquake contribute to large health needs? Kind of the after effects from that um, still require huge levels of support. Um, in total, we were one of 30 EMT teams that were deployed throughout the region. Um, as you can kind of see here, here's a bit of a, a map with where they were deployed and it's a variety of capacities. So we had a type three field hospital. So that's considered the kind of referral center the largest capacity, but um, there was many type twos um, scattered throughout the region providing similar levels of care. Um, some of them were a little bit more focused towards maternity. Some of them were a little bit more focused on outpatient and non-communicable diseases, but it was amazing to kind of just see the global uh, response um, come together to support health in the region. Um, we worked, um, and operated in 100% uh, capacity of the field hospital for the months of February and March. Um, but then we worked very closely throughout that time with the Ministry of Health to see um, kind of what their needs were gonna be going forward. So the infrastructure damage was the huge need. So yes, it's very important in the early days after the earthquake to come with all of the staff, all of the everything to support emergency health care in a region as the medical staff have suffered their own loss, their own homes are damaged, their own families have um, perhaps had death or injury. So they're not able to respond and come to work. But in the long term, even while maybe their physical hospital structure cannot be occupied and functional, um, the human resources and kind of the existing Ministry of Health systems need to be maintained. They need to kind of go back and, and kind of try to find their new norm while the infrastructure repair happens. So in support of that, we actually leave our entire facility um, in a country. Um, so we work with the Ministry of Health to see kind of where, where that's best needed and utilized by them. Um, so that way, 
it's supporting their system. So they um, they took over our facility and they actually changed it into an obstetric and pediatric hospital. Um, so this was kind of their layout for that. So we worked closely with them um, in support of all of the training and the operation support. So they'd be able to take that over. Um, so that's still operating today. They're seeing about 200 patients a day there um, and providing um, women and children focused care in the region. Um, in addition to health, uh, we also were able to, um, uh, sorry, um, so in total, while we operated the facility, we saw about 8,000 patients and did 270 surgeries. Um, in addition to health, we were also with our partner and in close cooperation with AFAD um, support in shelter. So we um, imported and distributed over 7,000 tents um, in to help set up communities, but also provide individual tents for people on their properties where they just were unable to access their home, um, but still needed to be close to their farm and their animals and other things like that. Uh, we worked in food and non-food as well, just distributing over 11,000 uh, food baskets, um, as well as provisions to be able to stock these tents to make it a home. So mattresses, solar lights, big, big, dignity kits um, and hygiene kits. Um, and then kind of our longer term program right now, um, as we continue to explore other ways that we can respond and through partners is through these hygiene trailers. So we have all these uh, tent settlements and um, places where people are living um, in non-traditional areas um, and the hygiene needs are huge. So uh, we're providing 120 of these trailers which have um, gender specific washrooms, showers, as well as laundry facilities um, to be able to help promote hygiene um, in these air areas and the health benefits that come from that. Um, we're continuing to work with our partners um, and see how we can respond in this next stage of the earthquake rig, um, recovery. So um, that continues to develop. So for more information, feel free to visit uh, samaritansfirst.ca. Thank you so much for the time and the opportunity to, pre to present. Thank you, Melanie, so much. Uh, I had questions set up for all of these and every one of the presentations have answered everything that I wanted to ask. So um, thank you. And uh, I encourage our viewers to please use the question and answer section if you have questions for our speakers, presenters, um, as we continue on with this session. Next on board is Rahul Singh, who has founded the da uh, David Ant. McAnthony Gibson Foundation, which is Global Medic, in 1999 to honor the memory of his best friend who tragically lost his life in 1998. Combining a passion of humanitarian assistance and frontline emergency perspective, uh, Rahul has developed Global Medic's unique operational mandate of providing efficient and cost-effective disaster relief in the immediate aftermath of a catastrophic um, catastrophe using professional emergency workers. Since then, uh, Rahul's tirelessly, uh, tireless efforts have created a globally recognized, innovative and efficient organization, earning him a spot on Time's list of 100 most influential people in the world in 2010. From the delivery of water purification equipment, the installation of field hospitals, and innovative programs like the unmanned aerial vehicles to survey disaster zones, Rahul is continually strives to develop Canadian innovation in order to save lives. He has personally led over 30 international disaster missions. Thanks so much, Rahul, and we look forward to your presentation. Thanks for having me. How's my audio? If someone just gives me a thumbs up, make sure it's good. Okay, perfect. So if you've never heard of Global Medic, we're a, a homegrown Canadian disaster response agency. We, Rahul, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Uh, we are seeing your next slide. We're seeing the speaker view, just so that you know. Why do I flip this now? I want to... Uh... I mean, if you're okay with it, but... Oh, it's fine. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm good. You can see the main slide. I'm trying to get it to a different screen, but it's not letting me. But you can see the main slide that just says Global Medic, right? All right. That's perfect. Don't worry. We'll, we'll get through that. So 
what we are is a disaster response agency that's you know homegrown. We're we're built right here in in Toronto. Our purpose is really to get the right aid to the right people at the right time. And you know, you've heard some great presentations from two different like fantastic groups, right? IDRF that we've worked with, they they do a tremendous job. We've worked alongside Samaritan's Purse as well. And you you've kind of seen the differences between you know a group that comes in with its hospital and then assists in in other systems, and you've seen you know, a Canadian donor into a, a local agency as well to to assist as well. We're almost an in-between. So our purpose is really to get the right aid to the right people at the right time. We, um, you know, we have our mission uh, that I just described. And these are kind of the things that we've done. We've run 249 ops. It's actually higher now. We've helped over four and a half million folks. And we've worked in 82 countries. Now, I'm going to fly through this, so just ignore everything that, that's coming up here for a sec until I can get to this slide, and we're going to talk about Turkey and uh, and what, what's happened in Turkey. The first thing that we really should talk about is the number of people that are affected because of this, this earthquake, right? So in Turkey alone, it's 15 million folks. In Syria, it's 8 million. And in reality, although these are two catastrophic events that occur a couple of days apart and they're really shallow earthquakes and the ground shakes for just over a minute. And, you know, when we look at them on the Richter scale and we're like, oh, they're in their sevens, you know, we're not really sure that they're that big, but you know, they're pretty shallow. You can kind of see on this slide here where the two quakes are, right? And, you know, how far apart they are and you know, how many days apart they are and their, and their differences in, in size. But wow, because they're shallow and there's a whole lot of people that live in this area, this is not a good recipe for, for uh, um, you know, the folks that are affected. So 15 million people are affected in Turkey, about 8 million people that are affected in, in Syria. Death toll, the official death toll in, in Turkey, you know, it was around 50,000. Uh, was the original numbers. Now, when you factor in the number of people that are missing or the bodies that they start to recover as they go through this re recovery phase, that number is really going to climb, right? Now, let's not focus on death for a second. Let's just focus on the living because we we talk about humanitarian assistance and we talk about getting aid to folks. You can see in our initial response the clusters of areas that we are working in, uh, in Turkey and in Syria. So you can kind of see you know, on the slide, the, the different places that we're working in, whether we're, we're working on food or water um, or, you know, NFI distributions. And then you can also see the area above it where the, the quake was. Now, the main difference between Turkey and Syria is as follows, right? People came to help Turkey, right? The world came in. You just saw Samaritan's first slide of medical teams coming in. There were some 50 countries that responded into Turkey with an incredible amount of assistance, right? Not so much in Syria. In fact, it's five days before the first trucks can cross the border on the second border crossing site, you know, to get in. Meanwhile, there's 8 million people that are affected. And this area of kind of northwestern Syria, 4.6 million people fled the fighting, which is further southeast, right, and fled government controlled territories to come up and literally live in camps and, and be in, internally displaced folks. And they had it really hard for the last several years of this war. Now, for them to have buildings collapse and for them to not have other teams come in, not have medical responders come in, not have medical capacity. And like you think of the folks that are affected in these Turkish towns, there's still the capacity for the country to absorb, right? There's over 100 million people that live in Turkey. People can open their doors. They can welcome their neighbors. You know, in Turkey, they they shut down universities, sent them to online learning so they could empty out the dormitories to put families in those dormitories. Very smart emergency management moves, right? They took over all the hotels, moved families in, you know, to hotels. They started setting up these camp cities. You heard IDRF talk about this container camps so that they're going to move people back into after they've been displaced so they can carry on with some sense of normalcy while people rebuild. None of this is occurring in Syria to the same level. And that's and that's absolutely tragic, right? Let me just talk to you a little bit about what we've done because there's some photos on there. First thing we did is we came in with these AR units, these portable water purification units, because if you think of Maslow's hierarchy and needs, right? You need oxygen in three minutes or you're done. You need clean water in three days or you're in trouble, right? Well, I, I can't get anywhere in three minutes, but 
In the first three days, we can get there and start setting up these portable water purification units and set them up in areas where people are either seeking refuge, seeking shelter, tent cities, or put them into communal kitchens where people are cooking meals. You've already heard about meals being distributed from some of our other panelists, right? So we're coming in and setting up systems to ensure that the folks in those kitchens are actually using clean water. Because you remember the story of Typhoid Mary, right? We don't want that occurring. So clean water into critical resources and is important. Coming in and putting clean water into those clinics that are damaged, the clinics that are popped up, the hospitals that, that, that need it, places of worship, places where people are going to go and ensure they have clean drinking water. It's one of the first things we did. We then started moving essential medicines around into some of these field clinics. And you know, one of the, one of the surprising things, because so many people are living in tents and outside, is the emergence of lice and scabies. And what their definition of mange is, I know we, we call mange something different, but so many young kids are getting this now. And just to have to push that level of medicine out on top of that ORS, you know, and you heard the, um, you heard Melanie talk about it from Samaritan's Purse. If you had high blood pressure before the earthquake, or you were a diabetic before the earthquake, your pressure is probably a little bit higher after the earthquake, right? You still have diabetes and your meds are trapped in that building. So we had to get people their essential medicines, just their basic meds as well. We also focused a lot on hygiene items, right? Just getting people things like the basic, like soap and shampoo and other items. And, you know, you do this in kit form and you get it out to families. In NFIs, it's the first time in our lives we've ever distributed like undergarments and then firewood. And we added to that propane and generators. Because one thing about Turkey in this region, in Hatay, this region that, that you can see we have pretty active operations in kind of the southeast part of Turkey on the Syrian border, there's a lack of trust for the local government, right? They're, they're, th this, this region used to be part of Syria before World War II, and then it was assigned to the Ottoman Empire, and they don't have a whole lot of trust with the government. In fact, they didn't vote for this government, and they feel that if they left their land, the government would take it over and they couldn't come back to their homes. So a lot of folks wouldn't move, right? They'd have their house, it'd be collapsed. You'd show up, you'd be like, but your house is collapsed. And they are literally living in their garden tent where they would grow vegetables behind, right? So our role as humanitarians is obviously to give people good advice and say, well, there's better services here, but if they're not going to move, right? If the 70 year old is not going to leave their house and they're going to sleep in that tent, you know, uh, in behind, you know, their home, well, we've got to go and get them food items, non-food items, access to clean water, all the basic things where they are. And that in Hatay is very different than Ghazi and Tip and Adiaman and Besni and Marash and these other areas, because a lot of those folks in these are, those are big, big cities, they were moved, right? And, and they complied and they moved because there just were no services, right? But in this other area, uh, and then this is Antakya as well, which is where the Samaritan's Purse Hospital is in. A lot of the population stayed, which was very interesting because it made it a lot harder to come in and, and distribute. So in addition to these NFIs, we're getting people food hampers. Because if you're lucky enough to be able to cook, we want to get you the items to cook. Culturally appropriate food. Let's just get you the food that you need and, and then move on. And then we also distributed what we call family um, emergency kits. So let me show you what, what a, a photo of a family emergency kit kind of looks like. I think I've got one right here. So two bucket system, super simple. Gravity moves it, no electricity, no moving parts. Mum is able to pour dirty water in the top of that. Gravity pulls that through and clean water is stored in the bottom bucket. Because remember, clean water is a key to keeping people healthy and avoids kids from getting sick. So thousands of these units would go in and what we would end up doing is distributing them out, um, you know, to families. Now, because we had a little bit of room in those kits, we would put in a solar light. Do you really think folks have access to electricity in this time, right? And then we would add in hygiene items, not a full kit, but soap and toothbrush and toothpaste. And we, we would put that, you know, into to folks as well. So that was super important to do. So I just want to confirm, I've stopped sharing, right? Like no one can see any of my my screen anymore. Okay, perfect. So you're going to focus on me while we while we talk about this and we just talk about Syria and how it's so different than, you know, working in Turkey. We're now in smaller trucks, right? We've got a couple of border points to cross into. And if we want to go from one area inside Syria to the other, we can't cross inside Syria to do that. We have to come back out around Turkey, 
go all the way around to the other side and come back in, which means we have to decentralize our logistics operations, understand that we're not coming in with big transport options. We're coming in on smaller trucks and we're reaching people that are now in makeshift camps and other camps and getting them those family emergency kits is absolutely critical. In fact, one of the partners on this call are actually working with us to do that as well, IDRF, right? So we are literally giving families, thousands of families, these family emergency kits just so mom can ensure her kids have clean drinking water because we don't want those kids getting sick. We don't want them getting typhoid. We don't want them getting cholera. We just don't want them dying, right? In addition to that, we put these emergency food kits in. So imagine a bucket and inside the bucket are all the food items that we know Syrians love to eat. So rice, big, pretty big staple there. Some folks in that region like bulgur put in chickpeas, different kinds of lentils, whether they're red or green, super important to ensure that the food we distribute is culturally appropriate. At the same time that we're buying food and distributing it in Turkey, it was really hard in the early days of this quake to buy food in Turkey to move it into Syria because Turkey was saying, look, we have so many needs. We've got to keep the stuff that's on our shelf for our country, right? You can't blame folks for saying that. It might surprise people, but this is what happens. We had to bring food down from Bulgaria, and now we're bringing food in into Mersin and then trucking it across. So the families in those 10 cities that we meet, thousands of them literally, are getting this bucket with food in it so they can cook. They then use that bucket to go get clean water or dirty water, their access to the water, and pour it into the top bucket of the other kit that we've given. So do you see the complementarity in aid that we're, that we're doing? So look at the different ways of, of responding. In Turkey, a wide variety of programs, right? In Syria, much less, because I only get one opportunity to see you in Syria. I want to give you water. I want to get you food. Now, we're still giving medical supplies and bigger water units into their clinics and their hospitals, but it's not as easy. I have to bring the Syrian team out to Turkey. We have to train them there. They go back in. They install it. We're doing this on, you know, like different virtual calls like we're talking here. It's a lot harder, right? It's just a lot harder. And if you look at, you know, the global response, wow, Syria has really just not gotten any of the assistance compared to, you know, compared to Turkey. There was a, a conference in the EU. They raised seven billion dollars. Six of it went to Turkey. Now, if we just do this on the basis of need alone, we said 15 million people were affected in Turkey, 8 million in Syria. Doesn't that sound like a two-third, one-third thing to you? Like of six or seven, shouldn't it be kind of like five and two or four and a half, two and a half, six and one? Like it's scary because the folks in Syria were so vulnerable, so vulnerable before the earthquake. They could least withstand, least have the resiliency to bounce back. And then they get the least amount of assistance. Now, because this call is talking about Canada's response, let's talk about our government's response for a second, right? Because it's important that we understand that the Canadian government didn't do a very good job on this response. One of the things that it did on the early days, it made this glorious announcement where it says, we're going to match $10 million to one agency. When you match only one agency, it actually comes at the very expense of the other agencies that are responding. And when you have a global crisis, let alone in two countries, and they are saying, we need the world to come in, right? You saw the, the slide coming in where all these global teams came into Turkey, right? When the Canadian government's policy just says, no, nope, funnel the money to one group, and it hurts the other groups coming in, the policy actually hurts the very same people that it's trying to help. Now we raised this issue. So two weeks later, the Canadian government came back and said, you know what, we'll do another matching fund, another $10 million, but it'll only be to another group of agencies. Um, so we're, we're gonna show that we're, we're reaching a little bit further out. But again, you double down on the same mistake. Several years ago, before this government, the matching fund used to be, listen, if you're responding, we're going to match you as an agency that are responding, but we're just not going to give you the money. We'll put it in a central pool and you can apply for that money. But do you see how that approach doesn't actually take funds away from agencies and drives them? Like the government should not use the force of its power to drive funds away from one agency to another. That's neocolonialism. It's just, it's just a wrong approach and it hurts people in their very time in need. So now we've got $20 million total of matching funds, right? The Haiti earthquake, $220 million in matching funds. So when did we get to one-tenth or one-eleventh, you know, of 
of a match and then a match that actually harms agencies coming in, right? Did you notice there were no Canadian rescue units, no Canadian military rescue units, no Canadian heavy urban search and rescue teams sent in because we don't have that capacity as a nation. Our government's kind of failed us here in making that, you know, capacity available. And before anyone says, oh, but Raul, we're on the other end of the world. Some of the key teams were in there were Fairfax 1 and, and Rescue 2 out of the U.S., which are right next to us, right? So these are a couple things to consider about the global response, right? Now, here we are, agencies like ours, doing our very best, getting in, boots on the ground, people there, our emergency responders in, delivering the right aid that people need. You've heard from other groups that talk about the hospitals they provide and the essentials of that aid. You've heard from the other group that talks about the services that it's providing through its local partners, just like we're doing, working through local partners, backstopping it with our folks. I think as a nation, we missed an opportunity to do more here. And I think that's a question we should be asking our elected officials and our government, because when the world's screaming out for help, if our government is failing them, you know, it's not it's not a good sign. Now, coming back to close, um, just because the earthquakes are over in Syria and Turkey, and this is off the front page, doesn't mean the need in those areas has gone away, right? You're talking about years of rebuilding in Turkey, and quite frankly, I don't know that Syria in this region will ever get rebuilt because there's only two access points. You can't come in from government-controlled sides. It's still an active civil war. And there are so many people in need in Syria that just don't even get the assistance that they do need. So I'd like to close on that. And although this is a Turkey-Syria talk, Syria has really, really dealt a bad hand on this. So thank you so much for having me and, and for uh, hearing me talk. Thanks, Raul. Um, you just brought us into a great opportunity to have some conversation. Um, if anyone has any questions, we're monitoring the question and answer session uh, on, on the chat here. Um, Media, do you have any questions that you see that we could uh, offer up to the panel? And panel, of course, if you see any questions that you can type your answer to, that would be great. Also, Raul I, and, and panel, just as we wait to uh, get some questions, you mentioned that, yes, the media attention is now off of Turkey and Syria. Like, it, literally, it's it's just like, one or two weeks maybe of attention and then it fades away, something else comes in uh, to take its attention away. How, do, how, does, it, how does your organizations um, raise an awareness and keep the ongoing needs uh, of earthquake affected communities after the media attention is gone? Like what do your organizations do to keep the donor funding happening, the advocacy? Each one of you, can you please like maybe give us a, a you know, a short brief answer yeah i'll just if start possible with, yeah i'll start real quick just because you, you you mentioned my name we don't do a good enough job like as a as an agency we are really responders we're there we're boots on the ground right away and it's just about you know matching needs and aid and getting it to, to folks that need it and we tell a few stories about what people need um, but we don't really advocate the government we're not we just don't deal with that let's it's not who we are and uh I don't really think that it's our role either. And uh, it is frustrating when you don't have a media calling out government on like, hey, what's going on here, guys? Like, why is this one tenth of, you know, what it was? And in this case, there was a lot more media coverage than you'd see because Turkey's easy access, right? Uh, it, it, very easy access for journalists. There was fantastic rescues several days later, you know, like, uh, and, and the media was getting that. And in this day and age of like social media and everybody having a phone, it's a lot easier to get imagery and store. And, and that's how you tell your stories with, with imagery. So if we can't even advocate for folks with all this kind of access and good heartwarming stories of people being saved and lots of rescuers in to help, like just every story on this was about Turkey. There was nothing about Syria, right? It just kind of shows you that. So we, we need to do a better job ourselves of trying to advocate. But I mean, like, even when we try to explain to our government, hey, the match fund's not that good, and they just double down on it, it, it tells you that sometimes folks don't want to listen, right? Like, even if it even if you're trying to tell them that this is a bad move. So but that is something that we should work on more is telling the stories of people in need. 
Um, so Raul, actually, thank you so much for such a candid presentation. We do have a few questions in the chat, but I just want to say that it is really important to have these candid conversations, especially when it comes to Canada's response, because, you know, this is the reason why we have the symposium is to just discuss those challenges and what we can do to make it better. And uh, yeah, so I'll just step up in a few questions, Sonia, and then we can. Uh, so we have a question from Elia saying, how about collaboration between humanitarian and development partners in Syria and Turkey? So I'm assuming about um, they're asking about how do you coordinate on the field? And that question goes out to everyone in the panel, anyone who wants to take it. Yeah, I can and I think put in a couple of two cents about that if, it, if it's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be talking a little bit later about uh, shelter coordination specifically within Turkey. Um, and and uh, the mechanism I was working in was specifically with Turkey, but we did have uh, uh, collaborations with the, I guess it was the cross border shelter cluster with with Syria. So this is a, a, a coordination mechanism that is intending to uh, develop uh, strategy guidelines and approaches for operational agencies that are, are operating between Turkey and, and Syria. So there, both of our, our coordination mechanisms were based in Gaziantep. And so we had the ability to sort of swap strategies and swap guidance that would be compatible between the two different responses and uh I, I guess try and build some coherence between between the two different responses now the contexts are very very different as as Raul very clearly laid out there are very different operational constraints that that uh that that uh, operational agencies have to to work within so it does get complicated and and the 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 ability uh, and the scale to which you can can coordinate between the two are a little bit difficult, but we did try and make those connections specifically with shelter. I can't really speak to the other uh, coordination mechanisms uh, with the, the other sectors or the the intersectoral OCHA type of, of coordinations that happen uh, 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 a layer uh, above me. but. Uh, that's my attempt to answer that, sorry. Melanie, uh, you wanted to say something about that? Oh yeah, what I just wanted to say was just kind of like, as we talked about like that coordination between the emergency response and the development side, um, I think there's just incredible value in coordinating with development actors who are present for a longer term in a context, whether that's Syria or in Turkey. Um, so sometimes in that kind of immediate like week or two after um, where they're scaling up, um, their kind of focus and their mechanism might be different and more focused towards that, but they have such valuable context um, partnerships and connection in a community. So I think with health, it's challenging because the EMT coordination comes in and kind of takes over and is doing all of the EMT coordination versus, versus like the health cluster, which is their more long-term, I think sometimes gets pushed a little bit to the side, um, but I think it's important that that's actually really valued um, and being able to partner with people. So making those connections on a more individual kind of partner level, as far as knowing like what the nutrition, what the um, psychosocial, what the mental health kind of capacities and resources are that you can leverage um, to be able as you transition from that immediate emergency response into kind of that long-term recovery. How do you kind of leverage um, both sides of that? So I think it's something that needs to be improved upon, um, but I think it needs to be recognized as like, even in a disaster, um, both sides really need to have a seat at the table. And Rahul, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, just a couple of quick points. So if you think about what Melanie was saying, how they bring in their hospital and then they leave their equipment to give to a transitional partner, you know, that's, that's great because that's capacity building post response. Like, we don't bring our water units home. Like I showed you photos of them. We give them to our partner. They're installed there and they're going to run there forever. And let's say they can reestablish their water. They can pack that unit up and then use it for another disaster, whether it's locally in the neighborhood or in, in the region, right? 
in terms of the other coordination thing, think of it like logistics. There's upstream and then downstream logistics, and it's with coordination. So when Melanie and her team make the offer of a level three hospital, they do it to one central point, right? That is upstream logistics, bringing it in. The quarterback, the team that says, yes, Samaritan's Purse, we're putting you in Antakya with your hospital. Here's your geolocates, go do it. That's downstream now. They're, they're going in as well. So when we come in with water units, we talk to Afad, we talk to the, the Turkish government, we talk to their consul here. Same thing. It's all coordination. Here's our offers. This is what we have. We offer drone programs as well to come out and map which has been used in places like the Bahamas and other places post-storm to help shelter cluster then go and rebuild. The Turkish government turned it down. Obviously, we can't put drones into Syria given its current context. So there is a lot of coordination that does go on. Coordination's always been one of the biggest challenges in, in this type of work, as, as you can imagine. There's been a lot of work that has, has gone on towards that. And it's on multiple levels. So everything I just described at the country level then turns around at the neighborhood level, right? So Melanie's team and my team would work together in Antakya. We would talk, you know, like like we like our people would be talking. Melanie and, Melanie and I won't be talking, but our people on the team would be talking, right? And perhaps. You know, where she's distributing NFIs or tents, we're popping in with food, but it's all coordinated through different groups. And that's the, the hard part of this, because sometimes the, the coordination models are late in setting up. Sometimes uh, there's just not enough, uh, you know, engagement and talk. Sometimes it's different languages, it's different products, right? But what you don't want to have is you don't want to have duplication. Like, I don't want to be showing up to the same town with 52 aid trucks and then see 16 towns next door don't get any aid, right? You want to avoid the gaps. And that's kind of how this gets, this all gets done. Two hours just doesn't seem enough. There's so many more questions. Um, I wanted to, again, remind everybody, uh, questions in the question and answer box. Our panelists will try and answer them as we move through. If you guys can take a look at it and see if you could provide your answers. I am passing on the baton to media. She's going to take care of the next section of presenters and, and the symposium. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Sonia. So uh, next up, we have um, Neil. I believe. Uh, so let me do a little bit of introduction about uh, Neil's background and work in the field. Um, Neil Bauman is a humanitarian shelter expert who has worked with the Canadian Red Cross and the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Society since 2005. Throughout his career with the Red Cross, um, he has worked in disaster contexts in many countries, including Pakistan, Myanmar, Indonesia, Philippines, Haiti, Nepal, and most recently in the Turkey earthquake response. In his current role as the global focal point uh, for the interagency standing committee shelter cluster, he supported preparedness and response coordination activities between local government authorities and many international and national organizations. Neil holds a degree in architecture from Carleton University, is a registered architect and council member with the Architectural Association of New Brunswick, and is a member of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. He now lives and works from the St. John, from from St. John, New Brunswick. Um, Neil, thank you so much for joining us. I'll give you the floor. Thanks for that. Um, I, I, I'm eager to have a conversation around coordination. It does seem to be the word coordination is popping up a lot today. And uh, I mean, maybe, maybe this presentation will sort of touch on some of the points that have been raised around coordination. I'm going to be focusing specifically on shelter coordination in Turkey, but uh, there's uh, other conversations to be had around the coordination, intercoordination between uh, other responses in other countries. I saw a couple of questions that came up about that. Um, but I guess to give a little bit of background on, on how I was deployed, uh, well, I, I, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the background about about the cluster approach in case people aren't aware of, of it as, as a, a method for for coordination. But I'll, uh, then I'll spend a little bit more time talking about the shelter context that we coordinate within and what we design uh, the operational approaches to be within. And, and I, I continue to monitor the response remotely from from my basement headquarters here in St. John, New Brunswick, but uh, uh, and then we'll, we'll have 
maybe an opportunity to talk a little bit more about it. But the so the cluster approach for those of you who aren't aware of what it is at the global level, uh, the humanitarian system is organized around these 11 clusters of which one of them is the shelter cluster, which I work within at the global level that that global shelter cluster is co led by UNHCR and the IFRC. So the IFRC has been tasked to lead uh, the coordination efforts for sudden onset natural disasters, which is sort of my, my specialty. And UNHCR tends to lead in the protracted uh, crises. So in this case, UNHCR is leading the Syria uh, coordination efforts, which ha also happens to be based in Gaziantep. Uh, and we we tacked on uh, a, a coordination mechanism for for uh, the Turkey response, also in in Gaziantep. The 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 approach for the for the cluster is to try and support the operational agency. So we, we heard already from a couple of organizations that are talking about what what they were doing in shelter, and uh, so our coordination efforts are to try and bring together all of these actors that are 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 implementing some sort of a shelter response and bring it into some sort of a uh, coherent common approach and share ideas and make sure that uh you know that we're not duplicating efforts in a particular location that we're um not having any gaps in the response and trying to address the needs of the most vulnerable in, in the, the uh, uh, affected area. So what we do is typically provide coordination support. That means like having meetings, bring, uh, bringing together the actors that are, are involved. We do some information analysis, data gathering and uh, uh, information products, advocacy, uh, and then we'll even provide technical assistance where we're needed to try and build the capacity of organizations that don't have the knowledge on, on how to, to implement uh, shelter uh, uh, operations or to, to uh, provide uh, trainings to the affected communities themselves. Now, in the case of, of Turkey, there were 57 organizations that, well, at, at minimum, that's the last count I had was different actors, either international organizations like Sam's Purse that presented or uh, local uh, uh, Turkish-based uh, uh, NGOs. There's the local government authorities. I'll, I'll, it's an, uh, quite a, uh, an enormous number of people who are uh, in organizations that, that uh, uh, arrive on the scene. So this is the basic principle of how we're trying to coordinate. Um, now for shelter, shelter is a little bit more complicated than it being just providing a tent. People, it's, it's really our approach to how we think about shelter is about think about how people live, how people are making the choices on what they're, where they want to live. Really about uh, get, uh, helping uh, the, the people make the decisions on how their recovery pathway may look in terms of sheltering. Now, in the case of this type of scale of disaster, people ha have to make their own decision as, as to where they want to be, where how are they going to engage with their own communities, with their own families, and, and, and if they lose their home, what do they have? What are their options available to them? And then how does the humanitarian community intersect with people's decisions that way? So, you know, this, this slide just represents a variety of different ways that people have self-chosen how they want to uh, shelter themselves after, after this disaster. People will spontaneously settle uh, nearby where they originally lived, or they may choose to, to move far away. And there's a lot of improvised uh, uh, solutions and lots of, of different ways that humanitarian organizations are, are assisting them. Or in, in the case of Turkey, a very strong government that is uh, behind all this. Afad, which is our partner in, in Turkey, 
uh, took a, a, a an enormous lead in in leading the response. So how do we intersect with the government in that respect? Um, pictures don't cover the the scale of this disaster, especially in the urban areas. If you go to Hatay, the uh, the the size of these buildings that have collapsed, the number of of uh, families that have lost everything in, the, in this disaster and and essentially the the community has become a graveyard and the the uh, uh, the cleanup from this is ongoing and will take a very very long time so the urban context here is quite uh, profound it's it's uh, of a scale that I've haven't really witnessed before. This is a very large, large uh, city. I compared it to like if the same thing happened in Ottawa, it would be uh, devastating. Um, rural areas were also uh, affected. So rural populations are affected slightly different than than urban populations. Uh, at, you know, there's a different building typology. People. Uh, the, the cost of where they're living, or if uh, the the fact that these are sing usually single family houses is a lot different than you know multi story multi unit buildings that that suddenly collapsed. And then there's issues of renters versus owners, those types of things that come up, and it gets very complicated really quickly. Um, so we found that. You know the 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 scale and damage density needs to be treated a little bit different in place by place. So the the strategy needs to be coherent with where we're actually implementing. And an implementation in a rural area might be a lot different than a than a, a implementation in a in an urban area. A, a, a key driver here is also the availability of land, uh, so that uh, you know. In a rural area, people are cho often choose to to uh, stay in the rural area because they still have access to their livelihoods or their community networks are all all still there, and they have the ability to to find a place to temporary temporarily settle. As opposed to Hatai, there's very little space and there's little little uh, rights or uh, to to occupy that land. Um, so this becomes another constraint to, to work with them. So, oops, sorry. Um, the two typical types of displacement that we're working in, uh, we're, we're sort of categorizing as formal displacement versus informal displacement. So the formal displacement is are people who are choosing to go to displace within the pathways that, the, that Afad and the, the Turkish government are supporting. So uh, and, um, there's been reference to them already about the, the uh, setting up of tent cities uh, that will transition into container cities. And these are, can uh, like this photo demonstrates, they're very highly structured. They're, uh, they're managed by government authorities. There's food provision uh, and building infrastructure around supporting them. So these become little neighborhoods. And you know the idea is that they'll start with a tent and they'll transition into a container. And these containers could be in place for many years, I suppose, while the, the possibilities around reconstruction get contemplated. Uh, and that's a whole other conversation to, to be had. There's many people who are choosing, for whatever reason, to not fall into the to the government supported formal system, uh, and in this case, we'll call it the the informal uh, situation. So these are people, these are people, families, communities that are choosing to temporarily habitate in places that are not supported. In, in my opinion, these are probably people that are the most vulnerable. These are people that have their, they may be receiving assistance from 
NGOs, other humanitarian organizations, even AFAD, but they're not necessarily structured, uh, provided uh, the, the uh, you know, food provision, water and sanitation, all of the services that go into how you live in a community, they, that may not be provided. So how do, again, how does the humanitarian community intersect with that and provide assistance to these, this population? And who knows how, how long people will be displaced in these conditions as well. Um, this is in Hatta. I see this, this, uh, this is an informal settlement that has just sprung up on the, on the outskirts of, of the community. Um, and you see a, a mix of different types of tents or uh, shelters that have been built up by, you know, tarps, different uh, types of structures. Keeping in mind, this is Turkish weather too. So it gets really cold in the winter and it gets pretty hot in the summer. So, you know, these aren't the ideal uh, sheltering conditions uh, for this type of weather. In addition, people after the, the, uh, the disaster had to displace outside of their own affected areas. So the, the, we tracked the the rental prices that have uh, changed in, in areas outside of the affected area. And we, we get lots of interesting data on you know, how, how people are able to manage on their own and what is, what is the effect on the rest of the country as well. Um, one last sort of issue is around how people's houses were classified as in terms of damage. There's a number of houses and buildings that are destroyed uh, uh, or demolished, and they're, for all intents and purposes, unlivable. And at the other end of the scale, there's their houses that are not damaged, and uh, and people could potentially live in them. But there's a fear factor. People are scared that they don't know what the the whether their house is safe or not. So there's people that are choosing to live outside of their their undamaged house because they're not sure or they're not don't feel safe living in their original home. Keeping in mind, and it was brought up a couple of times, there were multiple earthquakes. So, you know, there might, their house might have been assessed at one point uh, as being, you know, not damaged, but then there were future earthquakes and maybe there was other damage that was, that was provided there. So it, it, again, makes their choices more complicated as to where they want to live. Then there's this weird spot in the middle where there's a moderate damage. You don't really know how safe these houses are, and there's a strong, high likelihood of, of them needing to be demolished and rebuilt just to be on the safe side. Um, the Syrian population that, were, that are residing in, uh, in Turkey right now already were vulnerable prior to, to the, the earthquake and the the living conditions were uh, uh you know range from you know this which would be be kind of on the poorest side where you see this is their house on the right and their toilet on in the back and their water supply in the front and this is uh, a recipe for a future health crisis so some of our analysis uh, involves do, uh, and it came up in one of the questions around analysis on PIN, the people in need, and uh, how we classify and how we target interventions based upon uh, vulnerability. So the, we did we do mapping based upon a number of different criteria and factors uh, and data collection efforts to determine where where we should be targeting different types of interventions. So we, we produce these types of, of maps for our partners to, to uh, encourage or incentivize uh, agencies to work in certain locations. Also, again, we're talking about how people are choosing their, their long-term recovery solutions. We've mapped out a, a scenario about what the broader population movements might look like from uh, the displaced people, displaced populations living in both formal and informal uh, settlement uh, conditions, whether it's collective centers like dormitories or the tent centers, uh, informal sites, even host families, people 
of people who are hosting other families to live with them, and thinking about the protection issues that go along with that. And there's lots of other scenarios where we can bring in like Ukraine, where issues around host families have a significant amount of, of energy around the protection issues there. Uh, and then looking at possibly how rental accommodations can be fit in and how we can support families to, to uh, uh, get cash to enable them to rent. Now our rental property is available, not in Hatai, but they might be in other parts of the, pro in the country. And then there's uh, assessment types that we can do to the, uh, the families that have light or uh, light damaged houses to encourage them to move home if it's safe. And then what do we do with the people who are choosing to live at, at the site of their house, but it's heavily destroyed and can't and uninhabitable, but they still want to rebuild in site. So is there a way we can support at where they choose to live? Um, I'll just quickly, this is a bunch of numbers for a lot of people, but uh, this is just to show that as a coordination effort, we want to monitor the progress of, of the response. How many tents are being distributed? Are they being distributed to the proper location? How are the are the uh, tents that are being provided by humanitarian organizations being handed over to AFAD and AFAD being the implementer or agencies actually uh, implementing themselves? What is the transition like from tent to container? How are, how are families uh, uh, managing that transition? Um, and so we 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 spend a lot of time gathering data from our partners, uh, some of whom are on this call, and uh, seeing how how the uh, uh, the uh, implementation is progressing. And this is an interesting thing that came out yesterday: is is looking at the trends of how of, of the provision of of tents is now at the cusp of we're now seeing less tents and more containers. Um, and this, uh, this is something that we presume is going to continue, but now we're seeing the evidence this is actually happening, that people will be living in, in a little bit more of a durable solution, uh, definitely not a permanent solution, but at least is a little bit more safe than, than a tent. Um, the last slide I'm gonna show is just there's an enormous complexity here. There's a lot of issues that need to be considered. We and some people have already touched on things like asbestos, uh, the the need for for wash and health programs, um, the the need to coordinate at, at local levels. Uh, so the the how to engage agencies to 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 coordinate amongst themselves at a at a more granular level. Looking at winterization, summarization, uh, cash. This is an, a whole other uh, conversation to be had uh, around um, how we can provide a multi-intentional intervention that people can use to make their own choices and how they recover. How and and cash is uh, increasingly being seen as a as a useful intervention type. Um, and in the case of shelter, uh, I can say that when we provide multi-purpose cash, shelter is usually one of the top two things that people spend that, that money on, whether it's provision of rent or paying for their utility bills, or uh, in the case of emergency shelter, buying materials or buying labor. Uh, it's, it's usually an important factor for, for shelter. And then obviously reconstruction, this is gonna be 20 years or more, for this area to be reconstructed. How long is the humanitarian community going to be engaged here? Um, okay, I'm gonna close off. I've talked enough. Um, happy to take any questions and uh, thanks for listening to me for a little while. Thank you, Neil, so much uh, for this insightful presentation. I am glad you mentioned cash. I'm a huge advocate for cash interventions. Um, for the sake of our time, I think uh, if all the attendees can pop all their questions into the Q&A, and I also have a few questions for you, Neil, which I'll also do with this, uh, as well. Um, I did want to just confirm, because we are a little bit over time, are our speakers okay to stay a little bit um, 
past one uh, just so we can accommodate for all of uh, like just a good enough time for everyone. Uh, you don't have to mention it. I just want to put it out there. If you're not okay with it, we can uh, we can work something out. Okay. Perfect. So um, let's move on to the next speaker, which is Salamatu Muhammad. Um, Salamatu Muhammad is a specialist at Islamic Relief Canada. Her responsibilities includes overseeing uh, seasonal projects as well as a portion of the Middle East, North Africa, and Eastern Europe uh, portfolio. She is dedicated to incorporating decolonial frameworks into her work and is committed to ensuring equitable outcomes for the community she works with. Um, Salamatu, uh, you can go ahead. Thank you. Can I just confirm that everyone can see the PowerPoint itself? Yeah, yeah, I'm able to see it. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, hello everyone. My name is Salamatu. It's been great to hear a lot more about some of the work the other organizations are doing. Um, I'll be presenting on IR Canada's response efforts and ongoing humanitarian and development portfolio um, in Turkey and Syria. In this presentation, I'll be sharing. Um, I will be sharing a high level overview of IR Canada's projects in Turkey and Syria um, before the earthquake, um, and then moving in on to IR's overall, overall response um, since the earthquake occurred, um, and as well as sharing a bit on our global response efforts um, to provide more long term assistance um, to those affected by the earthquake. Uh, sort of as a big uh, quick background, Islamic Relief works to works with communities to respond and strengthen their resiliency to emergencies. We also use an integrated approach to address uh, our development programs around the world. Um, IR implements its own projects with a local team and has offices in both Turkey and Syria. So I'll share a bit on IR's work in Turkey. Um, IR has been active in Turkey since the early 2000s. Many of our projects are focused on improving the conditions of the refugee population and host communities, um, ranging in a variety of sectors such as health, livelihood, and protection. Uh, what you see on the screen are some of the project sectors specific for IR Canada. Uh, for example, we have projects focused on supporting the Uyghur uh, refugees living in Turkey. Um, and in that, we've done a project in the past that provided Uyghur Muslim or Uyghur Muslim women um, with uh, pastry making training as a culturally appropriate uh, form of income for them. Other projects have looked at um, better integrating Syrian orphan children into their surrounding communities by contributing to their personal development and um, improving their mental health and social skills. Overall, we look to meet the immediate needs of these uh, communities and connect them with more resources. Um, um, with our work in Syria, uh, when it comes to Syria, we've implemented um, numerous health, wash, education, livelihood, and what we like to call seasonal projects. So seasonal projects for us include winterization, which is uh, distributing winter items that are context specific. Um, and so in the case of Syria, it's usually just heating materials, uh, sort of like coals for families to use for warmth. Um, it also includes distribution of food packs during the Islamic month of Ramadan. Um, and so we implement projects like that on an ongoing basis um, in Northwestern Syria, and we've been doing so since the early 2000s. Our Syria team is very conscientious about collaborating and coordinating with local organizations and governing bodies and cluster groups uh, for all our projects. And they do this to ensure that there's no duplication of efforts and we're reaching those in need in a timely manner. Uh, for our health uh, sector, some specific Iron Canada projects have included um, dialysis support, project that was back in 2016. Um, and currently we're working with Awesome Canada and Awesome Syria to provide support um, to these uh, Sermata Rehabilitation Center in Idlib Governorate. Um, for protection activities, uh, our Syria team is focused on strengthening the referral system and services within Northwestern Syria. Uh, so this uh, includes increasing the availability of referral vehicles for people with disabilities and women. Um, other protection activities include counseling and psychotherapy sessions and awareness training or awareness raising on gender-based violence. In the WASH sector, um, IR is ensuring access to clean water through the establishment of water pump networks. So for, for us, it includes a lot of solar-powered water pumping. 
um, as well as water testing, cold water awareness raising, and the construction of wash facilities. Um, IR typically supports education projects through the provision of school supplies, um, covering teacher stipend and rehabilitation of schools themselves. Um, and we also have a project focused on shelter for families in Syria, which I'll be touching more on in a few slides. Um, going on to the emergency response or immediate emergency response. Um, as we've heard from other speakers, the earthquake of February 6 was one of the most devastating earthquakes to hit uh, Turkey and Syria. Um, as part of initial response efforts, our team was uh, coordinating with response bodies in Turkey to cover needs, clear rubble, um, and assist with rescue efforts. The same was also occurring in Syria, where our team was able to respond immediately um, with the supply, their emergency supply stock. Um, so they're able to use that while they waited for more resources uh, to cross the border into uh, northwestern Syria. Um, and I'd just like to share that from February 6th to March 23rd, 2023, the latest figures that I have on hand, um, IR has reached over 1 million people with this response efforts in both Syria and Turkey. But I'd also like to note that response efforts are ongoing. Um, so the response in Turkey specifically looked at um, IR responding in the areas of Gaziantep, Hete, and Kilis, just to name a few. There is more locations that can be uh, kind of, there are listed on the slides. Response efforts um, include the provision of food, such as rice, oil, sugar, dates, and water, um, as well as food vouchers, um, blankets, hygiene kits, and this has reached um, over 40,105 households. In Syria, um, our team was already um, active in the areas of Aleppo and Idlib. Their IR distributed a plethora of medical items, mattresses, tents, um, bread, blankets, water, and heating materials um, for those affected by the earthquake. Um, as IR Canada, we were also able to send in-kind support in the form of medicine and other medical items, medical supplies um, to Turkey through the Canadian Turkish consulate, and then ultimately it reached that back for distribution. Um, in this response, we've been able, we've been able to reach over 96,920 households. Um, so now speaking a bit more specifically on our shelter project, um, discussions for the shelter project in Syria began in early 2000, and it came as a result of the heavy rainfall and snowfall that occurred in Northwestern Syria uh, from December 20. 21 into the new year. Um, and so this is a, a, a possible proposal of a response that the team put together um, because as you all know, many families have been displaced um, in Syria and they've a lot of them have narrowly escaped with their lives and have lost like a lot of feelings of safety. Um, but unfortunately, they are still facing many of these difficulties and are still without that strong sense of safety. And with the ongoing crisis, families um, have been living in tents for over a decade now, um, which when you think about it, these tents are really meant to last like a maximum of two to three years. Um, so in these IBP camps and tents, there's a, um, they're suffering from the extreme weather in winter and then extreme heat in summer. Um, and tents are not well designed to withstand a lot of these climate changes, uh, which we is more reoccurring. I've even included some photos from the recent floods um, that happened towards the end of February into March um, in Italy. Um, so um, as a result of all these factors, um, the living conditions in the camps are worsening and we have to work to sort of provide more sustainable alternatives uh, for shelter uh, for these families. Um, so these shelters provide a long-term solution for the families uh, and the locations are secure and the families will have easy access to water, health facilities, uh, local markets. And as a general design concept, each home will consist of two rooms, a kitchen and a bathroom. Um, our team really consults the selected families as to what they want the design of the house to look like, but generally that is the format of the rooms included in the homes. Um, for IR Canada, this is a pilot project that began in July of 2022, and it has been a project that's faced many challenges um, since we began, uh, from like approval delays in Syria to inflation to procurement and uh, supply delays. And um, as even as IR Canada, um, not to get too much into compliance pieces, but we also have an obligation to um, select the same type of rights holders as a 
as, as a result of our compliant measures um, for these projects. Um, and so that has been a bit of a challenge for the team to work around as well. But thankfully, our team are very dynamic and they've been working efficiently to resolve these challenges. Um, after the delays that occurred all through pretty much 2022, we're able to begin construction this year actually. But of course, with the earthquake, this project has faced uh, further delays. Um, but ultimately, we were able to begin construction for the first phase um, of the shelter projects, which are basically standalone single um, shelters uh, depicted in some of the images on the slides, or you can see kind of like the beginning phase of the construction on the slides. Um, currently, we are looking to improve upon our existing shelter projects um, and incorporate a lot more earthquake proofing measures. Um, our team is working closely with the project engineers. Um, to adjust the next phase of construction, which we're hoping will actually include apartment buildings. Um, and we have to take this phase approach for the project because of um, the team wanting to reach more rights holders and kind of like working around our compliance piece as well. Um, and uh, these apartments are going to be multi-leveled. So we really have to make sure that they have strong foundations and have proper structures in place to limit the effect of future earthquakes as much as possible. Examples of these earthquake proofing measures include reinforcing foundations and adding more pillars um, to the shelter construction itself. Um, but as I said before, these uh, decisions are, these conversations are ultimately ongoing and a final decision on what exactly these earthquake proofing measures um, are still pending. Like our team is still consulting with the engineers to come up with the best way to move forward for the apartments. Um, I'm not so more so concerned with the um, standalone shelters as they are relatively safe and they're not multi-leveled. Um, and so they're, they're more earthquake resistant than um, the, 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 the multi-leveled apartments that we're hoping to construct in the next phase. Um, I've also shared a blueprint on the, on the slide as to what the apartment buildings will look like. Um, please note that it's just, I just wanted to share to kind of like share an idea of what their, the blueprints are and what we're kind of working with. And obviously with the earthquake, um, we're, this may change drastically from what I'm sharing today. Um, I would also like to share that these shelters are also a significant, significant part of the long-term recovery efforts in Syria, but other long-term recovery efforts um, include specifically for Turkey. We're looking to build upon the existing work that Islamic Relief does in Turkey. So these include providing prosthetic and assistive devices, as well as um, psychotherapy services um, in targeting the refugee populations. Our team has found that there is a high need for a project that um, not only integrate uh, the refugee populations into their host communities and vice versa, but also provide psychosocial support um, services um, just due to the traumatic experiences that these refugees, these rights holders have experienced. Our team has also made many strides for, towards providing the refugees with more sustainable livelihood op opportunities in Turkey. And so we're looking to increase those types of projects as well moving forward. Um, Iris Canada specifically is considering um, projects within the health, livelihood, and protection sector um, moving forward as part of our response efforts uh, for the earthquake. Um, in Syria specifically, we IR as a whole is looking to implement more projects focused on livelihood support, protection, health, watch, and education, basically all the sectors really um, across both countries. Um, and we will work with the communities in Syria to increase their livelihood potential, increase their access to much needed services um, like health, and reduce the uh, waterborne illness illnesses. Um, in this sense, IR Canada specifically is looking to um, increase our, our projects within shelter protection wash um, and wash as well. Uh, so the, I didn't do everything, but that's pretty much all that I had to share. So thank you everyone. But if you have any questions, please feel free to ask away and I'll work through uh, responding as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam, too. Uh, I really appreciate the insight that you've provided, especially when it comes to Syria and longer term interventions as opposed to like what it is happening right now and kind of like that that site into the future so 
Really appreciate that. Um, again, if you have any questions for Salam too, please go ahead and pop up the Q&A. We might have a few minutes afterwards to answer a few questions. Um, but moving forward, we will go into introducing our last speaker, uh, Mikhail Wahab. Mikhail brings about 12 years of experience supporting livelihood programming in challenging political and operational contexts in the Levant, the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia regions. Having a split time between project implementation in the field and consulting, Mikhail believes in evidence-based programming to engage the private sector to achieve humanitarian and development goals. Um, thank you so much for joining in, Mikhail. It's, um, I'm really excited to learn more about the insight that you'll be providing, just because my background is also in livelihoods in the Middle East. So uh, really excited. Super, thank you. Thank you, Madeira. Um, go ahead and share my screen. Thank you. Um, we've heard a lot of good stuff. Uh, my colleagues from you know, other Canadian-based organizations have shared a lot of pictures. I guess it's, it's my turn to really turn it around and bore you with some text now. Uh, bear with me over the next couple of minutes, uh, and uh, you know, I'd like to walk you through Care Canada's response in Turkey and Syria, um, noting that you know, uh, I guess what really makes us different from uh, the colleagues who've spoken is that we, we we put women and girls at the center of our responses. Um, so I'll start a bit about talking about us, uh, briefly comment on the situation we found ourselves in in February, um, the response, uh, and then uh, just end with some of the challenges uh, and the lessons that we're learning as we continue to implement in, in Turkey and Syria. Um, before I start, this is a picture of uh, the dry food truck uh, being unloaded in Ufa in southeastern Turkey. Um, so CARE is a is 75-year-old global confederation, uh, a global network of national humanitarian organizations providing humanitarian assistance and fighting global poverty. Uh, we place special focus on working alongside women and girls and really believe that when women and girls uh, are equipped with the proper resources, they have the power to lift whole communities out of poverty. Uh, in 2022, as of last year, CARE was working in 111 countries across the world. We reached over 174 million people with uh, over 1,600 projects. Uh, specifically in Syria, uh, CARE started working in 2013 with the start of the conflict shortly after. Uh, in Turkey, we've been based there since 1959, but uh, expanded operations in 2014 to assist with the influx of Syrian refugees. Uh, Care Canada is, is headquartered in Ottawa, uh, and we're one of the many member states which are part of the Care Confederation. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a local workforce of over 90 staff working across the country. Uh, a large part of this is made up of a stellar global programs unit of dedicated humanitarian uh, and other program managers and coordinators. Uh, who as of last year were managing and implementing 43 projects uh, around the world in over 30 countries, uh, being able to reach directly over 1.3 million people. We work in unison with a skilled team of program finance, corporate finance and compliance colleagues. Uh, we're guided by a very passionate public engagement team and we're looked and cared for after uh, by a team of people and culture leaders. Um, If I am to sort of talk about our response, I think I can categorize it under what we did on the international front, what we did on, on, on the Care Canada side. So we woke up on the morning of the 6th of February to find that two major earthquakes had occurred in Southeast Turkey and parts of Northern Syria. Uh, so the Care Emergency Group, which is part of Care, uh, you know, was on an international body, started coordinating with the various countries and the various clusters, as Neil pointed out. Uh, the country situation, uh, the in-country situation was assessed and shared, spokespeople were identified, key messages and press releases started loading in, uh, CARE deployed search support from across the confederation to support the response immediately, and we're still sending in staff now uh, as they continue to recruit some longer term positions. What was clear was that we were dealing with a very complex multi-layered emergency. 
and all the earthquakes occurred at a time when both Turkey and Syria were already facing humanitarian crises, including displacement, conflict, and economic hardship. Uh, this March, in fact, just last month, marks the 12th year of the conflict in Syria. Uh, Pre-earthquake conditions were not really friendly either. Before the earthquake struck, uh, communities in, in southern Turkey and, and northwest Syria were already facing fragile food security due to record inflation, especially female-added households and, and, and uh, Syrian refugees. Uh, initially, there was a lot of support from the regional office. Uh, there was an effort not to overwhelm the country office in Turkey uh, for a lot of you know, reasons, uh, even Rahul's pointed out. Access to Gazi and TEP was not possible in the very early days and learning from early responses we've had, this can create more problems sending in too many staff without clear support to accommodate them. The country office needed time to assess the change, the damage, care for the team members who themselves were affected. Uh, and at the same time, we had a lessons learned document circulating where we tried to apply lessons learned from previous earthquakes. Um, Care started collaborating with local partners uh, based on the information we were getting out of the clusters, distributed essential items such as hygiene kits, tailored to the needs of women and girls, uh, tents, mattresses, blankets, uh, and also preparing to support the potential influx of internally displaced persons from northern Syria. Uh, and this was not easy, as Rahul explained, three out of the 20 gates, three out of the 20 border crossings between uh, Turkey and, and, and northwest Syria were, were open. Six of them were restricted, which meant uh, you know, convoys needed uh, authorizations uh, for every single movement. So with three out of 20 gates open, it really made things complicated. Uh, and here in Canada, uh, we activated uh, our crisis management team, or as we like to call it, the CMT. This is an internal decision-making body made up of key members uh, from the humanitarian team, from philanthropy, from outreach and communications, finance and HR. And, and, and the mission here was to decide on a collective response. Uh, the question that we were grappling with and that we continue to ask now is, how do you deal, uh, how do you program to deal with a multi-country emergency in an already going on crisis, you know? Uh, for a good two weeks, uh, the CMT worked tires tirelessly to coordinate a Canadian response to the crises. Uh, decisions were made to launch a fundraising appeal to the public, uh, so this included engaging the Canadian media to inform the public about the emergency, coordinating press releases that were coming out of the country office, building a fundraising page and updating it frequently. Uh, the, the effort from the team really, really paid off. You know, the, our, our philanthropy side was able to raise more than 662,000 uh, for the response. Uh, and we raised over $340,000 from the Canadian public. Uh, at the same time, there was a decision to I enter an appeal with the humanitarian coalition. Uh, I understand not a lot of fear on the panel are members of the EHC, but just to provide some information, the EHC is a collective of Canadian humanitarian organizations uh, that come together, join forces to raise funds uh, and provide Canadians with a simple way to, to support uh, programming uh, in international disasters. So a lot of our role for, for Canadian-based organizations uh, was to bring you know, these donations uh, and working in liaison with the country offices to make sure that the money goes where it needs to be. Recognizing this as a multiplied vulnerability, uh, you know, people were already stressed due to the conflict in Syria and now the earthquakes, uh, worst earthquakes to happen in decades. Uh, we launched an appeal ahead of the HC and then coordinated a response focusing on relief and recovery. Uh, and now we're implementing this response in southern Turkey and in, in northwest Turkey. Um, also, uh, Care Canada hosts a rapid response team, uh, basically a group of 10 very skilled individuals who are based across the world. Uh, and, and they immediately de deployed Turkey as supporting business development, program management, and, and information partnership functions. Uh, we faced a lot of challenges in the early days and the response efforts, including extreme weather conditions snowstorms that blocked access to roads, warehouses, and supplies. Uh, local partners, including uh, uh, care, care country office in Turkey, suffered losses in staff, infrastructure, and assets, which made it even more difficult to support the communities while caring for our own. Uh, ensuring the safety of, of care staff was, was key, and herein lies a challenge uh, that many humanitarian organizations, uh, and my colleagues on the panel included, are probably realizing in the aftermath. 
as humanitarian workers, how do you stay and, and, and deliver aid? And at the same time, extend the duty of care to your own employees and staff when disasters strike communities that are already delivering assistance in response to an ongoing crisis. So it's, it's a double-edged sword, so to speak, of humanitarian work. And, and, and we're still learning a lot. Um, moving on, I guess. This is, uh, this is Tahani. She uh, and her family were living in the town of Jindiris in northern Aleppo. Um, they lost their home uh, and they were moved to the Atta camp in, in Jarablus, Aleppo. Um, they moved to a camp that was initially provided to host the, uh, the internally displaced persons from the Syrian conflict, but now we're hosting scores of people from, from the earthquake. Uh, Care here provides partners with clean water and waste management, sanitation services, and mental health support. Uh, so you know, it's Tahani holding a picture of a house that they lost. Um, what came out of the early assessment efforts in Turkey and Syria, and which is guiding our response, uh, it's, it's worth spending, I guess, the next couple of minutes on. Uh, it's a document uh, we produce and we call rapid gender analysis or an RGA. Uh, it's basically a tool that care users and other organizations use to assess the gender specific needs and vulnerabilities of people affected by the crisis. Uh, we consider the specific needs of women and girls in all aspects of the response from the needs assessment to service delivery so we can design effective responses uh, so the remaining bits of this presentation will focus on some of the key areas of need and vulnerabilities that the, that the study highlighted um, and some of the challenges and barriers uh, that we face while implementing. Um, it, it's, it's clear, and I guess it's, it's, it's not news, but it's been shared by some colleagues on the panel as well, that women and girls are the most, most vulnerable populations in the aftermath of disasters. They, they face a range of specific challenges and needs. Uh, just to highlight a couple of instances, uh, women and girls face a higher risk of exploitation and trafficking in the aftermath of disasters. They may be forced into early marriage or sexual, sexual exploitation in exchange for food, shelter, or other needs. Uh, they're at risk of child marriage as families see it as a way to protect their daughters from the risks of living in temporary shelters or displacement camps. Disruptions in, in, in schooling and disruptions uh, of, of, of health facilities have a disproportionate impact on the girls. They may are more likely to drop out of school to help out with chores and to take care of family, unpaid care work, what we call, uh, and, and due to disruptions in health facilities are at risk of complications such as pregnancy and childbirth. Um, realizing this, I guess we've, I'd like to share some, some of the findings from, from the study. Uh, findings that are driving our response. This is, this is Shahad. Uh, she's from a village in northern Aleppo. Uh, her family also lost their home in the earthquakes and uh, they currently live in a tent near the rubble of their home, uh, trying to rebuild their life um, and, and directly uh, benefiting from, from the assistance a lot of humanitarian actors are providing in the area. Um, I guess, firstly, the conflict and displacement have had a significant impact on the livelihoods and economic security of people in the region. Women and girls are more vulnerable due to social norms and gender-based discrimination. Uh, and as a result, women are at a higher risk of falling into poverty and are you know, maybe unable to provide for themselves and their families. Secondly, access to basic services, such as education, healthcare, water and sanitation are also impacted by the conflict. And women and girls here are also more vulnerable due to the prevailing social norms. Uh, they may be unable to meet their basic needs, which in turn has indirect impacts on not only their health and well being, but those that they care for directly. Thirdly, the conflict and displacement, uh, as I've mentioned, increases the risk of gender based violence for women and girls, especially those who are displaced and living in camps, at a higher risk of experiencing violence. Some of the recommendations that we're, we're programming um, that we share in the analysis uh, are as follows. Here is right in the center of this picture is, is Rami Araban. He's a care, he's a staff at Care Germany. And he was actually uh, stuck in Turkey when, when the earthquakes happened. Uh, and this is uh, an image from a makeshift camp 
set up during the quake where Rami was staying. So this slide outlines some of the recommendations that we're programming uh, for addressing gender specific needs in humanitarian settings, such as the earthquakes. Um, one of the recommendations that we have is to prioritize livelihoods interventions that promote equality uh, and, and, and women's empowerment. An example is uh, a, you know, a product called the Village Savings and Loans Association program. And it's a tool that we're implementing in countries such as Mali, Tanzania, Nigeria, Yemen, uh, the DRC even, uh, which basically provides women with access to financial services and training allows them to start their own businesses and generating income for their families uh, and is one of the earliest ways to, to support early recovery. Uh, access to basic services, again, one of the recommendations coming out of our analysis that prioritize interventions that promote uh, access to services that put women and girls at the center when providing water, health and sanitation facilities. An example is uh, a, a wash program, a water sanitation and hygiene program that we're implementing in Jordan that works to improve access to clean water uh, for Syrian refugees living in camps um, and looks at constructing gender sensitive latrines, showers, and then providing hygiene and menstrual kits uh, at a time of need. Protection and safety uh, is, is one of, is, is I guess the last but not least recommendation to come out of the analysis. Um, an example of, of, of one project that CARE is, uh, or, or I guess, so to say, another tool that CARE has is the creation of gender sensitive uh, safe spaces. Uh, and these are basically safe spaces for women and girls who've experienced gender-based violence, uh, providing them access to medical and legal support. Uh, and we have these in our interventions across uh, Central African Republic, uh, in the Middle East, and now here in, in Turkey, in Northwest Syria. Uh, overall, these recommendations, they highlight the importance of incorporating uh, approaches that put women and girls at the center of, of, of the responses and, and recognizing explicitly what their needs are. Um, but again, these aren't free of, 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 the, of the challenges um, that we face. Uh, and without getting into much detail, and I'm sure my colleagues on the panel would, would, would share these, um, not sure of this, yeah. Um, limited funding and, and resources for gender sensitive programming. Uh, CARE is struggling, uh, you know, to, to find uh, the proper funding for our efforts to implement gender sensitive programming. In response, we engage in advocacy efforts to secure more resources and find innovative ways to leverage existing resources to advance equality. Uh, another challenge is limited awareness and understanding of humanitarian actors on the importance of integrating gender sensitive work. This can lead to a lack of buy in on programming. Uh, to address this, care is repeatedly working, constantly working to build capacity for its own staff on the importance of recognizing programming that puts women and girls at the center. And we've developed a lot of tools and resources to support the integration of, of gender considerations into our responses. In some communities, uh, resistance from the communities can also hinder the effectiveness of interventions. Uh, CARE, as well as other colleagues, I'm sure have faced challenges in promoting uh, equal opportunity for women in contexts where gender-based violence is pervasive and deeply entrenched. Um, limited access to data is another challenge. Uh, what do you do when you don't have enough data that talks about the gender specific impacts of crises and the needs of, and vulnerabilities of women. It makes it very difficult to, to design and implement programming. Um, finally, there's, there may be limited participation of women and girls themselves in decision-making processes. Uh, to address this care, it actively works on, on making sure that we have women and girls engaged in every step of our decision-making processes. Uh, but again, these are challenges that, that, that we all face and are the reality of our work. Uh, and, and one solution, unfortunately, doesn't, doesn't really fit all. Uh, the lessons we're learning um, to address these challenges, it's, it's essential to educate and raise awareness amongst us as humanitarian actors about the importance of integrating gender into our work, uh, really understanding why gender matters, 
how can we integrate it into programming? Um, and to this end, CARE has, has developed a gender and emergencies toolkit that provides guidance on how we can integrate gender in such settings. Promoting the participation of, of, uh, of women in decision-making processes. Uh, this means promoting their participation and leadership roles, engaging them in community consultations, needs assessments, and making sure that their voices and perspectives are, are heard and acted upon. Uh, it's, it's crucial to really improve our data collection analyses um, and abilities. And, and you know, this is Rahul pointed out how, how Canada lacks sort of uh, the hardware to respond to emergencies, I guess, collecting data is, is a big, big, big part of this gap, you know, uh, because uh, the, 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 the higher the ability we have to collect disaggregated data by sex and age, uh, the better we can really inform our responses. Uh, and really then to truly under, under you know, understand what, what this means, because uh, it's easier said than done, we really need to tackle the underlying causes of gender-based discrimination. Uh, means you know, promoting gender equality in all aspects of programming and challenging the harmful norms and stereotypes that exist in our work. Um, I'd like to end with, oops, I'd like to end with a quote here from one of our colleagues in Turkey. Um, I guess give us a minute to read this. This quote from from Basma during the response really highlights the vital role that women play in supporting their families and communities during times of crisis. Women are often the primary caregivers and providers of emotional support for their families and their resilience and strength should be recognized and celebrated. As we're working towards more responsive, more inclusive humanitarian programming, it's important to acknowledge unique challenges women and girls face We've heard a lot of good stuff today, uh, but I'd just like to end by saying, let's not forget the contributions and sacrifices of women, uh, my, my esteemed panel colleagues included, uh, who are at the forefront of humanitarian efforts, often risking their own safety and well-being to support their families and communities. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, really appreciate that presentation. I'm uh, especially glad you kind of mentioned about the lack of gender-based data and how that is, that can be, that is a crutch for a lot of organizations trying to plan um, inclusive programming. Um, so thank you again for joining us. Uh, so I see here from the Q&A uh, section, there aren't that many questions left. I think all of our panelists responded to them. However, I do see a statement from Angela thanking Raul and Raul wanting to answer this question live. Uh, Raul, if you're still with us on the call, would you still want to answer that question? Uh, I'm still on the call. I just made a mistake in how I was answering. I just <laughs> the kind words. So I answered. No words. So. I'm Amazing. an old dude, technology, and I don't get along. No, no nonsense. Uh, thank you so much, Roland. Thank you to all of our panelists. I really, really appreciate all of your insight and, um, you know, communicating the challenges that we've gone through uh, as organizations responding to crises like that and upcoming crises that might be in, in, interacting with the ones that already exist and exacerbating vulnerable communities. Um, yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone. And if there are any, um, if there are no further questions, I will pass it on to Dr. Asghari and uh, for closing remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Media. Thank you, uh, Sonia, and and everyone for a great presentation. Uh, words really cannot explain uh, what you have been doing, and uh, so I'm going to. Uh, make a quick summary and also uh, look into our future uh, event. Uh, Rebecca and Hannah, uh, amazing job. And uh, especially working with communities. Uh, and I like what you mentioned uh, as your platform, uh, people working for people. This is, this is really what uh, humanitarian response uh, is all about. And thank you for what you are doing. Uh, Melanie, it is incredible how you were able to set a, a, a temporary hospital in such a fast uh, and short time and being able to to provide such so important support especially during the third earthquake i mean this shows how important it is to be there when something happens and uh, thank you for highlighting that 
And Rahul, thank you for, for emphasizing uh, the difference between the situation in Turkey and Syria. Uh, this has been on uh, discussion for uh, throughout this, this uh, uh, event and, and disaster. And thank you for bringing that to up and the fact that we, we, we need to re-examine a government response to, to the situation. Um, and Neil, thank you for walking us through uh, what Red Cross and Red Crescent uh, Society uh, through uh, IFRC are doing on shelter management, uh, specifically on uh, the, the, the difference between uh, formal and informal uh, temporary shelter. Uh, that is important also, and, and uh, a lot uh, we can learn from that. Uh, so I want to thank you for uh, uh, mentioning about uh, uh, and uh, focusing on the livelihood and importance of livelihood in, in the post-disaster recovery and reconstruction. I think this is, this is really, really important. And also the fact that you are already focusing on permanent housing, uh, especially in Syria, that that is that is really uh, really good, uh, Mikal. Uh, I I think you 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 summarize everything, uh, uh, and everyone uh, was talking about, uh, and more interestingly, uh, with focusing on the importance uh, of uh, attention to uh, women and girls' needs uh, during major emergencies and catastrophes like this and doubled with, with the crisis uh, already going on. And thank you for, for, uh, for your efforts in that. All together, I, I really want to thank you all for uh, all your efforts and what you are doing. Uh, this is important. I think Canadians are really proud of what you are doing. And uh, I'm sure they will be supporting what you uh, have been doing. And uh, uh, I hope we have been able to bring uh, this group together so that we also introduce what you are doing to uh, larger uh, audiences. And uh, from CFAL York and also by Emerge at York University, uh, we, we also would like to continue our collaboration with you and, and support you in uh, whatever way we can through train, uh, additional training, joint collaboration, uh, field activities, and so on. And I also want to conclude that uh, we aim to have uh, another round of this uh, symposium on June 14, uh, hopefully uh, bringing uh, government sector into uh, the conversation, uh, whether uh, uh, their representations or uh, those people who can speak about government response to uh, this, this event. And for now, thank you all. Uh, for being with us, uh, despite uh, we went uh, a bit out of our uh, scheduled time. Uh, thank you all for, for uh, attention uh, and looking forward to meeting you all again. And thank you for moderators uh, as well as the speakers uh, uh, today. Uh, we really enjoyed your, your presentation and excellent job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all.